Welcome to everybody. I'm uh, really uh, pleased to have all of you connected to this uh, event that he, we are very uh, proud of, uh, uh, you know, of having the uh, opportunity to provide the IK van der Burg Prize. Let me just give you, uh, an, let's say, a summary of, uh, on one side, uh, why we have this prize and who was, in some sense, uh, IK van der Burg. Well, she was a Dutch politician and a member of the European Parliament. Uh, she was also uh, part of the European Parliament's Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs. And from 2011 till 2014, she was a member of the European Systemic Board's Advisory Scientific Committee. And clearly, in recognition of her contribution, the European Systemic Risk Board has established this annual research prize. And uh, it is a very special research prize because uh, Mrs. Uh, van der Burg was dedicated to the notion that finance should serve society. And this prize is administered in that spirit. It is from, this, from 2014 that the ESRB is awarding this prize. So this is pretty much this, this is the seventh edition. And it is devoted to young researchers. So applicants must be under 35 years old, both the authors, or you know, if you have more authors, all of them has to be below this uh, age. The topic should be related clearly to the ESRB mission of preventing and mitigating systemic risk, and clearly also to uh, try to improve financial stability. This year we received 24 very nice submissions. You know, uh, really research, young researchers are uh, making huge, huge progress in their ability to produce research through the different years that we saw uh, the different application. And uh, as you may already have uh, uh, observed, the winner are Caster uh, uh, Mueller from the National University of Singapore and Emil Werner from MIT. And the paper that is the winner one, the title is Credit Allocation and Macroeconomic Fluctuation. Uh, the research question that this paper is addressing is on what is the role of finance and credit in particular on macroeconomic fluctuation, but also on financial crisis. And the key aspect of this paper is that it is distinguishing between good credit and bad credit by looking to different credit provided to the different sectors. Clearly, this research is in the spirit of the IK main purpose, so making finance serve society. But I do not want to anticipate too much. I'm now spending a little bit of time on the housekeeping information. So uh, as you know, you know, I'm suggesting to all of you to mute your microphone and limit the back background interference. Do not use your webcam when, uh, unless you are, you are talking. Please use the chat function and uh, uh, to all panelists to ask questions. And uh, we will have a section where questions will be addressed during the QA, Q&A. But, uh, you know, uh, going back to uh, the, the main, let's say, uh, program of, of today, uh, the plan is that uh, we will have the presentation of the paper by, uh, you know, the authors. Uh, and this will be for about 30, 35 minutes. Then, and I would like to thank, uh, uh, we will have uh, remarks by Philip Hartman from the European Systemic, uh, from the European Central Bank and Sebenem uh, Otskamp that is a member of the advisory scientific committees, they will provide uh, on one side comments to the paper, but also they will also give to us a broad view about the topic of, of, of the paper. And then we want to dedicate uh, uh, 20, 25 minutes to a general discussion with question uh, and answer. So I will give also the opportunity to the author to reply to the point raised by Philip and Sebenem, clearly also Philip and Sebenem will continue to intervene, but on this part, I will really appreciate if uh, uh, a significant part of you will ask questions and try, you know, to develop knowledge about uh, this very interesting topic. Uh, we are planning to end uh, at uh, about a quarter to, uh, to five. So uh, I do not want to take uh, uh, other time to, uh, you know, to this section, and, and I'm uh, inviting uh, the author of the paper to start their presentation. I want to remind them, hi, I want to remind them that they have, uh, that you have 35 minutes, and, uh, uh, you know, I will then, uh, by the way, congratulations for the prize, 
we really appreciate your work and we are learning a lot from your paper. So congratulations first and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Loriana, for that very, very kind introduction. It's an absolute pleasure and an honor to be here. Uh, before I start our presentation today, I just want to say it's, it's really a great honor to receive this recognition. And um, this project has been in the works for many years. And so uh, as a result of that, uh, over the years, you really accumulate a lot of debts. We really owe many people both that have worked with us and that have taken the time to talk to us about these issues. But um, most importantly, of course, we want to thank the ESRB Advisory Scientific Committee for selecting our paper. We're just really happy that we get to be part of this conversation. And so let me start my presentation right here, and then I would appreciate um, some feedback on uh, whether that works for you. Again, thanks so much for having us. So the motivation for this paper here is that rapid expansions in private credit are often, but not always, followed by deep economic downturns and financial crises. And this is a well-established finding going back not only to the 2007-8 crisis, but also seems to be a more general pattern. But despite this well-established finding, many questions about credit cycles, about how credit markets interact with the wider economy, we think remain really quite poorly understood. And so, for example, why is it that some credit expansions tend to end badly so with these economic downturns, but others are actually linked to positive growth experiences or even growth spurts. And if that's the case, then how can we tell apart these good booms from bad booms to use some language from a recent paper by Gorton and Ordonis? And perhaps on a more fundamental level, does it matter who gets all that credit during those credit booms, which we think is kind of an uh, intuitive question to ask. And so what we try to do in this paper is to show that the sectoral allocation of credit matters for understanding the link between credit booms, macroeconomic fluctuations, and the incidence of financial crisis. Now, why should we focus on the sectoral allocation of credit? Our motivation here comes from models of credit cycles that feature heterogeneity in terms of sectors. So most of the models in this literature distinguish between three major sectors in the economy. So Think of one uh, about firms in the tradable sector. So for example, large manufacturers, then you might have firms in the non-tradable sector. Think here of construction firms or small restaurants, and then you have households. And what these models really emphasize is that these sectors may differ in how sensitive they are with respect to credit supply or financing conditions more broadly. And these sectors might differ in how sensitive they are to changes in household demand. And what these theories will then predict is that credit to the non-tradable sector and households in particular can lead to economic downturns by fueling unsustainable demand booms, by contributing to a buildup of systemic risk or a buildup of financial fragility, and by lowering productivity growth through a misallocation of resources across sectors. Now, if you think about perhaps the most prominent theories of credit cycles that, that are out there, they, on the other hand, do not really tend to emphasize this kind of heterogeneity on the borrower side. For example, you think about theories that stress the net worth of financial intermediaries, or you think about behavioral factors, there, this heterogeneity is not important. So whether the allocation of credit matters empirically is, we think, uh, very much an open question. And so to get at that, we need to measure who in the economy actually receives credit. And it turns out that that's a very difficult question to answer. In fact, if you look at existing efforts um, in terms of credit data, it's not really possible to measure that. And so just as one example here, um, this, there are very widely used data sets by the Bank for International Settlements or the IMF and widely cited work by Jordan Schuller and Taylor. But at best in those databases, you can see how much credit goes to firms and how much credit goes to households. And so to make progress here in our theoretical understanding really of how credit interacts with the macroeconomy, the backbone of this project is a new cross-country panel database that we think is quite a departure from these data sets. So what's new here is that we can measure the allocation or distribution of credit 
across an average of 16 sectors in the, in the economy. We cover almost 120 countries and we can go back for many countries to 1940 or 1950. And it's exactly these data that allow us to study empirically the link between different types of credit expansions, business cycles, and banking crises. And so just briefly preview the results here, we find what we think are quite striking differences in macroeconomic outcomes following different types of credit expansions. So the kind of headline finding we have is that growth in credit to firms in the non-tradable sector and also to households is systematically associated with a slowdown in economic growth in the medium run. But if you look at credit expansions in the tradable sector, that predicts stable or even higher economic growth. And consistent with models of credit cycles with this sectoral heterogeneity, it's lending to non-tradables on households that predicts a boom-bust pattern in demand, a higher likelihood of a systemic banking crisis happening, with defaults being concentrated, again, in the non-tradable sector. And it's also these types of credit expansion that are associated with lower productivity growth, which could suggest a misallocation of resources across sectors. And so the takeaway that I really want to emphasize here is that whether credit booms tend to end badly or not seems to depend to a significant extent on what that credit is actually used for. And the central finding here is really that distinguishing between different types of firm credit is really important for understanding credit cycles. Now, of course, you know, we're far from the first to think about the link between credit markets or finance and the real economy. And this slide here cannot do justice to the important work that many people uh, have done in this area, including many people uh, of you present here today. And so what we most directly speak to are the many, many studies uh, on the link between credit and financial crises on one hand and credit and economic growth on the other. And so our contribution here is to draw on the insights of this large um, mainly theoretical literature in international macro to build what we think of as a bit of a bridge between these two empirical literatures. And so more specifically, we show that differentiating between different types of firm credit along the lines that are emphasized by this international macro literature is useful for understanding when credit booms predict bad outcomes and when it predicts not so bad outcomes or even positive experiences. And we think that this is quite a departure from thinking about the world through the lens of how leveraged the private sector is or how leveraged banks are. And what we want to emphasize is that who in the economy gets credit, so this allocation or distribution, seems to be just as important or you know, maybe even more important than just thinking about how much credit is there in the economy. Okay, so as I mentioned, the paper introduces a new database on sectoral credit that's the result of a multi-year effort. And so to construct these data, we drew on more than 600 individual sources. Many of them were newly digitized. Many of them were previously unpublished, and we got them by simply contacting uh, more or less all the world's central banks, financial regulators, and statistical offices. And a key contribution here is that we systematically harmonized the classification of sectors, both across countries and across time. And we were only able to do that because we got a lot of help. And we got help from more than 150 people working at the national central banks, the statistical offices, et cetera. And so the result here is a data set that covers domestic credit, mainly bank credit, but also bonds and non-bank lending where that data is available. It spans, as I mentioned, almost 120 countries, and in many cases going back um, 70 or 80 years. And we'll make these data available as soon as possible sometime this year, including an extensive documentation. And we hope that this will be useful uh, for many other people as well, and we, we plan to continue working on it. Now, just to give you some intuition, I'm showing you here comparison between um, total credit relative to GDP, uh, averaging this across countries, where um, this is kind of the dark blue line down here. And then, you know, we're plotting that against the same data from the Bank for International Settlements on bank credit, which has been widely used. And what you can see is that these two lines essentially just overlap. And both of them suggest that in the long run, the ratio of private credit to GDP has increased. What you see at the top is the BIS data on total credit and kind of encompassing all types of debt. And you can see that you know, we're tracking the trend here as well, but 
uh, this has kind of a, a higher level than our data. So how I want you to think about our database is that essentially we can provide a breakdown of what actually accounts for credit to GDP that you can get from existing data sets. Now, what's nice with these data is that they allow us to provide some stylized facts uh, that we think are, are kind of extending existing work or uh, are novel. And so, for example, we can confirm with a much larger sample than previous work that it's really household debt that, in, that explains most of the increase in this credit to GDP ratio over the past 50 years or so. You can see that in the graph here on the left-hand side, at the dark blue um, shading, this is household debt, and there hasn't been as much movement in firm credit relative to GDP. But what's really novel here is that we can also look at the breakdown of lending to firms across different industries, which is what I'm showing you here on the right-hand side. And so what this suggests is that the share of agriculture, but also manufacturing and mining in particular, has really decreased quite substantially since the 1980s or something like that. And you can also see the role of lending to firms in construction and real estate. So that made up perhaps three or four percent if you look at, uh, say, the early 1960s. If you look today, lending to construction and real estate, so these are not residential mortgages, this is firm credit, makes up uh, something like 25 percent of all outstanding firm credit. Now, next, I want to show you a case study that I think is very much representative of what we see happening in our data around major credit booms, both in advanced and emerging economies. Now, as many of you know, Japan experienced a major credit boom in the 1980s that was followed by a banking crisis in the early 1990s, which I'm shading for you here in, in gray. And what this graph shows is how the ratio of credit to GDP in different sectors has evolved over time, indexed to be 100 here in 1985, but you can do this in many different ways. And what the patterns here suggest is that this Japanese credit boom was concentrated not only among households, but also among firms in real estate development, and more, maybe more importantly, also other non-tradable services, like for example, accommodation and food. So it's not just about kind of a housing story, there are also these other non-tradable services. Now, in contrast, if you look at manufacturing, you see that despite this massive ongoing credit boom, if anything, there was actually a decline in manufacturing credit in Japan during that uh, episode. Now, another and entirely different example here comes from South Korea, which experienced a kind of prolonged boom in GDP growth starting in the mid-1960s. And that boom followed a major banking reform that happened in 1965. And uh, what we see in our data is a really sizable increase in manufacturing credit following that reform that is not mirrored by other sectors such as lending to households, construction, other non-tradable services. And one reason why that may be the case is because there was a huge policy initiative to basically force banks to lend more to export intensive activities. Now, to get at these types of patterns more systematically, we'll start by constructing three measures of credit growth that are motivated by these models of credit cycles with sectoral heterogeneity. And so that means we look at lending to the tradable sector, by which we mean agriculture, manufacturing, and mining. We look at credit to the non-tradable sector, by which we mean construction, real estate, um, retail and wholesale trade, accommodation and food, transport and communication, although you can define that slightly differently and it won't make much of a difference. And we look at lending to households. And so a key question here, of course, is how do these firms in the tradable and non-tradable sectors differ? And of course, they differ in many underlying characteristics, but the first difference that's emphasized by many of these open economy models is that industries might differ in how sensitive they are to household demand. And for that, some data we're using here from the World Input Output Database suggests that domestic households consume something like 36% of the output of non-tradable sectors compared to only 15% of tradable sectors. So that means um, here that the non-tradable sector is much closer to final household demand than the tradable sector. Perhaps unsurprisingly, the tradable sector also trades more. It has much higher um, export to value added ratios. The second difference that's emphasized by these models is that these financing constraints may vary across sectors. And here we find that small firms that may be more financially constrained, they're much more common in the non-tradable sector and real estate collateral is much more common 
in the non-tradable sector. And this is true even outside of construction and real estate. Now, a third important difference is productivity. Here, we're just using data from a paper by Manon and Castillo, and that suggests that both in levels and growth rates, the tradable sector is much more productive than the non-tradable sector. Now, because it's difficult to pin down empirically which of these characteristics exactly are more important, in most of the paper, we follow the reduced form approach of the theoretical literature and focus on this high-level distinction between tradable and non-tradable sector. Okay, so equipped with this kind of basic intuition, I'll now show you impulse responses from local projections that are commonly used in this literature. So what that will mean is we look at regressions of changes in log real GDP in a country I between a year T and a future date T plus H. And we'll regress that on country fixed effects and then on different measures of uh, lag credit growth. So we'll look at credit to the non-tradable sector, the tradable sector and households relative to GDP for now. And we're going to look out 10 years into the future and make sure to saturate these models with lags of the dependent variables and the credit growth measures to kind of soak up mean reversion in those variables. Now, I'll show you two sets of standard errors here, both of which take into account the serial correlation here. So, you know, we want to uh, make sure that we take into account that these credit booms are not random in terms of timing, and they're also not random across countries. And while the impulse responses I'll show you, they don't necessarily capture causal effects, but we think they answer an interesting question, which is conditional on you seeing a particular type of credit expansion. What on average happens to GDP and other types of micro markets? Now, the patterns you see here are the main result of our paper. What you can see is the response of real GDP to innovations in credit to the non-tradable sector on the left-hand side and the tradable sector on the right-hand side. And for now, these do not take into account household credit. And what these impulse responses suggest is that lending to the non-tradable sector, to firms in the non-tradable sector, systematically predicts a slowdown in GDP after four or five years, but lending to the tradable sector is associated with stable or even higher GDP growth. And in the paper, we show that these patterns are not only highly robust, but importantly, all, they also hold if we control for the composition of the economy. So if we control for the share of the non-tradable and tradable sectors, uh, this picture will look almost identical. And it will also look almost identical if you look at credit relative to value added. Um, and so how I want you to think about this is that it's not just about a reallocation of economic activity towards non-tradables that's associated with lower growth. It's this reallocation towards non-tradables with an increase in leverage of that sector. Now, from previous work, we already know that household debt is associated with lower growth. And so this is something we can replicate here as well if you look at the graph here on the, on the right-hand side. But importantly, even when we control for household credit, this leaves these patterns for non-tradable and tradable firm credit unchanged. And we also find a similar pattern when we replace the dependent variable here uh, with unemployment. And here we can see perhaps even more strikingly that it's really lending to firms in the non-tradable sector that's associated with a spike in unemployment in the years going forward. And for these other types of credit, these patterns seem to be somewhat more muted. And this really suggests is that, um, what it really suggests is that we have to think about firm credit as well when we want to think about macroeconomic fluctuations. Now, up to this point, we've taken this kind of reduced form approach following many open economy models and only differentiate between tradable and non-tradable sectors. But of course, we can also just split firm credit using um, potentially important uh, variables that are kind of the primitives in these theories of credit cycles. So what I'm showing you here are the results for splitting firm credit based on the median value of two of these characteristics. So in, in panel A here, um, we're, we're splitting credit based on the proximity to household demand. And in panel B, uh, we're, we're splitting it based on the share of small firms. It's kind of one of those proxies for financing constraints. And what you can see here is that um, these results line up quite closely with our main distinction of, of tradable and non-tradable sectors, where firms that are close to final household demand or, or, or industries that have many small firms they predict kind of a boom bust pattern in GDP growth. While if you're far away from final household demand as an industry, if you have very few 
uh, small firms, and maybe you're less financially constrained. These types of firm credit just have a positive and kind of constant uh, correlation with, with the GDP over time. Now, an alternative approach here is to ask, what does the path of GDP look like around the peaks of different types of credit booms? So to look at that, we first identify slightly over 100 credit booms in our sample based on a detrended measure of total credit to GDP. And then what we do is we divide these booms into two buckets. The first bucket is what we call non-tradable biased credit boom. So these are 75 cases here where during that credit boom, there's an increase in the share of non-tradables and households. The remainder goes into the tradable biased credit boom bucket. So these are cases where the share of the tradable sector in total credit increases. And so here you can see, uh, if you look at the orange line, that it's really the cases that look like Japan, where you see this increase in the share of the non-tradable sector in total credit that are associated with a slowdown in economic growth going forward. While if you look at cases that look more like Korea, where you see an increase in the share of the tradable sector, those do not um, look like kind of economic crashes. If anything, you kind of see uh, just, just growth just continuing or only slightly slowing down following the peak of the credit. Now, what we've seen so far is that credit to the non-tradable sector and households is systematically associated with, with lower economic growth and higher un, uh, unemployment in the medium run. And so models of credit cycles with this sectoral heterogeneity, they mainly emphasize three key predictions um, that could give rise to such a pattern. So number one here is that lending to non-tradables and households should be linked to a real exchange rate appreciation and should be linked to a reallocation of economic activity towards non-tradables. And you get that, for example, in work by Schmidt Groen and Uribe in the 2016 JPE paper. Then second, uh, lending to non-tradables and households should predict financial crises. And once you're in a crisis, the losses, they should be concentrated in non-tradables. And you get that, for example, in the work by Schneider and Tornell. Now, third, lending to non-tradables and households should also predict lower productivity growth where in work by Ricardo Rice or Benigno and Fanaro, this is because the tradable sector is just more productive. So if you give more money or more credit to the less productive non-tradable sector, that will kind of slow down the macroeconomy. And so in the remainder of the talk, I will show you some empirical evidence that is consistent with all these predictions. Now, first, in the data, we find that changes in credit to non-tradables and households are associated with an increase in the ratio of non-tradable to tradable employment. So that's what you see here in, in, in column one. That is intuitive. But we also find that lending to non-tradables in particular is associated with a real exchange rate appreciation, which you can see here in this column two. And so what this might suggest is that these types of credit expansions really boost demand in the economy rather than the productive capacity of the economy. Now, next, we turn to look at um, differences in financial fragility across sectors. And so our starting point here is some data on um, banking, crisis, banking crises, which we take from um, some joint work by my co-author, Baron Vernon Xiong, 2020, and by widely used work by Levin and Valencia. And so here, I'm just replicating the existing literature, which has found that um, before the onset of these systemic banking crises, we usually see an increase in the ratio of credit to GDP. So here we kind of get positive changes in credit to GDP. But what our data allows us to do here for more countries and existing work is to first look at patterns of firm versus household debt around crises. And here, really the key takeaway we have is that household debt tends to expand somewhat earlier than firm credit around these crises. But more importantly, we can also drill down and look at what is it that accounts for the growth in firm credit in the run-up to financial crises. And here we find that almost the entirety of that firm credit growth before financial crises is driven by the non-tradable sector, where there are very few changes in tradable sector credit. And what is key here is that this non-tradable sector firm credit expansion is not only driven by construction and real estate, which you might imagine, but we see a very similar pattern for other non-tradable services such as trade, food and accommodation, or to a lesser extent, transport and communication. If you look at tradable sector credit, if it's agriculture, manufacturing, especially, um, these are just flat around the incidence of crisis. Now, we can also confirm these findings using standard predictive regressions where 
the dependent variable now is a dummy for the onset of a crisis. And the independent variables here are different measures of credit growth. And what we find here again is that um, it's really lending to firms in the non-tradable sector. That's a statistically significant predictor of future banking crises, even more so than households, while tradable sector growth is just essentially uncorrelated with the incidence of banking crisis. And just to give you a sense here of the magnitudes, the probability of a banking crisis is something like 3% unconditionally in our sample. If you have a one standard deviation higher growth in credit to non-tradables, that jumps to something like 9 or 10%, which we think is quite sizable. Um, now, a key question here is why exactly is it that these non-tradable sector credit expansions seem to matter um, so much more for the likelihood of a financial crisis? And here, theory again gives us clear guidance where, in particular, models like Schneider and Tornell 2004, the source of the crisis, really the, the immediate source of the crisis are large scale defaults in the non-tradable sector. And so in the data, we indeed find that the non-tradable sector is really critical for understanding defaults after banking crisis. So here in these figures, I'm focusing on a case study, which is the Spanish banking crisis of 2008. But in the paper, we also have a graph now with a total of 10 banking crises for which we were able to gather these data. And so let's start on the left-hand side. What I'm plotting you here is the ratio of non-performing loans to total outstanding loans by sector. So think of this as kind of a sectoral default rate. And so what you can see here is that following the 2008 banking crisis and kind of going into the Eurozone crisis, the default rate of firms in the non-tradable sector was around twice as high as that in the tradable sector. So quite, quite a pronounced difference. Now, as you can imagine, credit before this Spanish crisis was really concentrated in the non-tradable sector and housing sectors in particular. And so taken together with the higher default rates there, what this meant was that um, the vast majority of non-performing loans after the Spanish crisis was concentrated in the non-tradable sector. So the share of non-tradables in total non-performing loans in Spain, 56% according to our estimates here, really much larger than the non-performing loans accounted for by households. And they make you know, the NPLs in, tradable in the tradable sector and others irrelevant. And so what this suggests to us is that if you want to understand the non-performing loans that are kind of the likely immediate source of banking crises, you really have to look at firm credit and you really have to look at firm credit to the non-tradable sector in particular. Now, uh, we also find some evidence that the sectoral allocation of credit is associated with differences in productivity growth. And so in particular, lending to the tradable sector predicts stable um, uh, uh, or, and, or even higher labor productivity growth, total factor productivity growth going forward. If you look at lending to non-tradables and also households, that tends to be associated with lower productivity growth, again, both in labor and, and TFP terms. And while we want to be careful in interpreting these patterns, they are at least consistent with the intuition from, from these models by Ricardo Reis and Benino and Fanaro that credit flowing away from the tradable sector towards sectors with lower average productivity could reflect a misallocation of resources. Now, to conclude here, we argue in this paper that the sectoral allocation of credit is important for understanding these linkages between credit markets and the, the wider macroeconomy. And we believe that the patterns that we document here provide a bit of a new perspective on why credit is sometimes associated with economic growth, this kind of finance growth view, and uh, sometimes and perhaps more often with e economic slowdowns, this kind of credit booms gone bust view. And so we also think that our results have a number of um, potentially interesting implications for, for theory and also for, for policymakers, um, which is that number one, we think they show that this heterogeneity in firm credit is really important for understanding credit cycles. And differentiating between household and firm credit and housing and non-housing credit, a lot of focus has been put on that, both in terms of theory and, and, and regulation. But we think this is very important, but it's not, uh, it's perhaps not the entire story. And of course, last but not least, we, we also um, want to be super careful here, but if you take these findings at face value, um, they do suggest a potentially stronger role for, for sectoral regulations, 
although there are many, many caveats that you could come up with why this might be a bad idea, not least political constraints, which, uh, which I think are potentially quite important. So let me just take the opportunity again to say thank you for the privilege of uh, getting to present our work here today, and thanks so much, everybody, for engaging with it. So thank you very much, Carsten, for the very nice presentation. And also, you know, I will give time later on also to Emil to, to intervene. Uh, I think that uh, thank you also to be on time actually earlier. Uh, so we are moving now to, let's say, the, the discussion or the, let's say, part of the panelists. So the first one is Philip Hartman from the European Central Bank. And he has, of course, a lot of comments on, on your paper. Philip? Yes, thank you. I need the sharing option um, enabled. No, thank you. So now I can. Yeah, in the meanwhile, of course, I don't think that I need to present you, Philip. You have a long, let's say, series of, of paper of research, and clearly this topic is very close to your agenda. Yes, uh, thank you so much. You should see now the uh, my presentation. Can you see it well? Um, yes. Let me do it. Um, you can make it a little bit bigger. I do it in full screen now. Yes, that's perfect. Okay. Good. So yes, thank you, Loriana. That I'm uh, I'm very happy to uh, to just to 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 make a contribution to this uh, nice ceremony. Um, and um, I, uh, you know, obviously could do a long laudatio about what's so great about this paper and so on, but I will gloss over this uh, a bit quickly and come to the essence uh, quickly. Um, but let me just say that, uh, so why does this paper deserve the prize? It provides a public good to the research community. Great compliment to Jorda Schuler, Rick Taylor. Make it available online as soon as you can when you have the latest data. It finds evidence for an interesting and theoretically well-founded hypothesis about the non-tradable sector. And it does us a favor to, alas, re uh, harmonize, to, to, to reconcile micro and macro again after a somewhat frustrating paper by Moritz Schullerich a short while ago. Um, it's inspiring for policy. I will say in my remarks later that um, actually I think it's a, a nice input into policy making, very much in line with the current policy process. Um, and actually, by doing so, uh, I realized while trying to uh, do some charts on these type of issues that you have in the paper, that we absolutely need more harmonized sectoral credit data for the EU and the euro area. Even in the EU and the euro area, you have to go to the national sources in order to know how much is flowing in the construction sector in one country and how much in the accommodation sector in another country and so on. And I think for macroprudential policy, this is critical that we have uh, data um, right away rather than having to use unharmonized. And the paper is relevant for Europe. Europe. Um, um, so, uh, and uh, so it's, it, it, it resonates very nicely with the story of the European financial crisis and the role that non-tradable sector played in there. Just want to warn that there's an additional component that's not the focus of this paper in that crisis, which is the short interbank lending that created the big sudden spot, spot which partly financed the flow, the capital flows to those sectors. But let me go to the essence. So um, basically what I will do, I will make one or two remarks on the paper very quickly, but then I will go applying it to current situation, to Europe, or the, the last 10 years, say, uh, to Europe and to kind of policy relevance. Before I do so, um, here in this uh, chart, um, I put down what Karsten just presented as the main result of the paper. Um, and uh, this is the business cycle part, not the financial crisis part. And what I want to um, alert you to is in the business cycle part that if you throw in um, the household credit into the estimations, um, yes, the non-tradable credit survives, but one sees it's kind of weaker 
and uh, less statistically significant, which is, as he just explained, not actually the case in some of the crisis regressions. And he uh, provides a battery, they provide a battery of um, uh, evidence that how relevant the non-tradable sector is, and in some crises and cases, even more than the household sector. But what I want to point out here is just, obviously, and the authors don't claim that, but just for the general audience, the the household uh, relevance of household credit for systemic crisis is not dead at all. If anything, in the business cycle context, is uh, still slightly stronger and more robust, but that may not be in every crisis. And that it's not so significant in the business cycle may just be uh, a usual lesson from history is that even though we find a statistical regularity, it may sometimes be that actually uh, you have to still look at the cases. In one case, it may play a bigger role than non-tradable credit, in others, less big role. And that may be reflected here. Let me go to Europe today. Um, so here um, I borrowed from what Moritz Schularik presented a few days ago in the ECB forum on central banking, uh, because he actually replicated a part uh, uh, this for more recent data, uh, because your data stopped uh, in 2014. And he wanted to know whether the corporate credit, the non tribal corporate credit is actually a problem in Europe today. And uh, so what you see here is uh, the red line is the US, the blue line is France. These are the countries that's all normalized uh, to one at 2015. And you have non left on the left, the non-tradable, on the right, the tradable sector. And you see that actually in, in the countries that he covers here, uh, the problem is uh, uh, not so pronounced in the last few years in Europe, except for France to some extent and the US, which is not, uh, not our Euro area. So um, it doesn't seem to be a, a, a generalized issue in uh, the euro area at present that we are in danger of a non tribal corporate credit boom that may turn into some type of crisis. Now, let, talk, let me talk a few words about the French case, because this seems to be the exception here. There has been strong credit growth in France for a while. Um, it's not limited to the non-tradable sector. Uh, you see on the right, it's also to the tra uh, tradable sector, the corporate sector, and, and also the household sector. I have a backup slide where I could show you that also the household sector is quite similar. Now, this development would also be more attenuated if you would calculate these figures on a net debt basis rather than a, a gross debt basis. Because in our days, many companies tend to be cash rich and nevertheless take a lot of debt. So that may actually be attenuated, this dashed blue line, if you take this into account. Um, nevertheless, uh, since this credit issue in France is very well known, has been addressed by the authorities, um, first of all, through a very interesting macroprudential measure, which is the tightening of large exposure limits by banks to highly indebted French companies. This is a special macro pro measure under this famous article 458 of the capital requirements regulation, uh, which is still active today. It was adopted in uh, July 2018, and uh, it is still valid. They, they also adopted a more broad based counter cyclical capital buffer and one year later in July 2019, but then released it, of course, when the COVID cover, uh, crisis hit. So. Um, so I would argue that the general impression that uh, even there may be other countries where non-tradable sector corporate credit at present is a, is a major concern. But here, I would say it's not special compared to other credit and it, 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 there have been some measures to address it. OK, then the next thought is um, about, um, you know, is as you yourself address, is this a traditional construction and real estate story or is this a um, is a really peculiar story for also non uh, non real estate related sectors. So I plotted here what we did here. We took the the authors uh, data together with the Schularik data to extrapolate the authors data to more recent data and broke down the non tradable sector for two countries, France and Spain, into the sub components into construction real estate, wholesale accommodation in food and red and transportation communication information in green. So what you see is that the French case is actually where the real estate part or the um, uh, construction part actually dominates. However, if we, you turn to the right where you have the, the Spanish case, where actually most of us would think, well, they should really have construction in, uh, in the forefront um, and, and real estate. Uh, you see that actually in this case, 
it's not dominating. So um, actually, uh, con uh, uh, wholesale accommodation, food and transportation and communication uh, and information is actually similarly important in this cycle that you see here. Um, and actually, I could even, I didn't show it, but I could show you a third case where actually you see that actually Austria is one, I think Germany is another, uh, where actually the, the transportation, for example, would dominate the other two sectors. So yes, I agree with the authors, this is not just a, a resurrection, a re rediscovery of a, uh, even for the present European situation, for the, um, um, for the big role of uh, housing booms and busts for business cycles and financial crisis. All the sectors, the subsectors, the, how the, the, the authors are able to decompose compose them for a long historical uh, database actually um, are kind of relevant depending on the country and depending on the time. So that leads me to my last part, which is the question, the relevance for policy. So first of all, as the authors point out, this has been embraced by the Basel community to have a, a work on a sectoral um, uh, corporate credit, uh, it's like a, a counter-cyclical uh, capital buffer, sectoral counter-cyclical capital buffer. There was a working paper and there was even a guiding principles issued a few months later in 2019 about how to operationalize, operationalize such a um, corporate sectoral, sectoral uh, uh, counter-cyclical capital buffer. Um, the, in the Europe, actually, there's also already things being implemented. The Capital Requirements Directive and the, uh, the new Capital Requirements Regulation that became, that actually were adopted in 19 and came, became a, applicable as of January this year, uh, except for the countries that haven't implemented the CRD5 yet, actually contains a, a, a systemic risk, a sectoral systemic risk buffer option. And this uh, systemic risk buffer can, the sectoral risk systemic risk buffer can be used for um, actually in a similar way as if it was a sectoral counter cyclical capital buffer by the countries. The European Banking Authority has already issued a guideline about how to deal with the subsectors, which subsectors can be covered and how can you choose them. Obviously, they have to be systemically important and so on and so on. And so on but other than those criteria, actually, you can go to the subsectors in the European macroprudential framework now and apply systemic risk buffers, uh, even in a counter cyclical way, uh, for the purpose of um, uh, dealing with or addressing the banking risks related to the um, to uh, uh, non tradable corporate credit booms. No country has used it so far, obviously, because we are playing still in the COVID crisis. So um, uh, we have other problems to deal with right now. That's my last slide. So obviously, as you should from a policy side, so we are in reasonably good shape. Uh, the research uh, is accompanied by uh, frameworks, policy frameworks at the G20 level, but also at the European level. Uh, France, I mentioned, has done something, but obviously there are a lot of caveats, as also uh, I think Karsten finalized. Obviously, by adding these more granular instruments, we're making the framework more complex. Think about if you have several sectors that move in certain directions and you add to the overall counter-cyclical buffer, that's these sectoral ones, it can be kind of become really quite complex. The process is still unreformed. It's quite complex to actually adopt these measures. And as countries have proven to be a bit slow in actually using these counter-cyclical buffers, which left us with a situation where the macroprudential space to release them in the downturn situation was actually not so large, actually rather tiny. But maybe having narrow measures actually makes it easier to adopt them rather than the quote unquote nuclear option of a cross uh, across the board um, um, uh, counter cyclic capital buffer. Um, now, th then another caveat is obviously this is only for banking. Uh, this doesn't uh, cover non-bank financial intermediation. We have said it very often in the ECB, we would like to see the, the European framework to evolve more towards the non-bank intermediation where the credit growth is, is, is growing more. And obviously the corporate debt security is widely held outside balance, bank balance sheets are also not covered here. In adopting these measures, you have to look at the trade-offs um, and do cost-benefit analysis and mind about leakages. And let me stop here and uh, hand you back to Loriana and Shebnam. Thank you very much, Philip, also for being on time. I think that uh, 
you raised several points and I will give them the opportunity uh, to the author to, to answer to your question, but now is the turn of 7M. Even for 7M, she's clearly a member of the Advisory Scientific Committee. She's doing a lot of research on uh, small and medium enterprise, uh, also, uh, you know, with, uh, with an eye on what happened during the COVID in terms of non-performing loans and so on. So again, uh, um, we are very curious to know what you are thinking about this paper and what is your view about the issue that they are trying to address. Thank you very much, uh, Loriana. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me just make sure uh, you see my slides in the full screen view. Is everything good? Everything is fine. Perfect. All right. Okay, thank you so much. It's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, talk about uh, this paper. So my um, talk is going to be first, of course, uh, first and foremost, congratulations to the authors. It is, it is very impressive work on credit and macro fluctuations. Uh, I'm going to try to highlight uh, uh, how impressive the contribution of this work and also the policy relevance and then combine it with some new insights from Europe and United States uh, that doesn't come from sector level data, but firm level data. So, and this will give an idea to you. I hope that, I mean, what the author started has been great and now we should push this agenda further to a more granular level. So we should think about where does credit go, credit allocation, not just by sector, but also by firm <coughs> and, and, and author's work makes this uh, extremely clear. Okay. So let me start by putting this uh, in the context of the literature. So there's an extensive literature, first of all, linking credit cycles to business cycles. Uh, this literature, in fact, has been around because this was the story of the emerging markets for a long time. But of course, it came to uh, even, um, you know, under a bigger light after the 2008-2009 uh, advanced country crisis, right? Lehman crisis, European crisis. And now uh, the work has been done to carry this to a historical setting, influential work by Jordi Schuller Taylor and also uh, Mian Sufi Werner and other papers. So they, these papers show that, uh, you know, in a historical context, which of course we all realize that, you know, advanced economic data is going to be what, what is out there, especially when you go to 1800s, household credit is extremely important. Then, as I said, we know firm credit is extremely important in emerging markets. Of course, this, you know, I don't cite all the, all the papers here, but this literature goes back to 1980s, starting with Latin America uh, debt crisis, first focusing on the sovereigns and state owned firms, and then uh, extended to Asian crisis, uh, Argentina, Turkey. I mean, there is this understanding that, you know, the, the firm credit is extremely important. A recent incarnation of this work is shown uh, in my Jackson Hole paper in 2019 uh, and the recent forthcoming Aristat paper using very detailed granular uh, credit register data, which exactly tells you which firm gets what, uh, which again seems to enforce this conclusion that we really cannot ignore corporate now, the, the, the debate is a little bit on, okay, how is, can we also say firm credit is important for advanced economies? This is going to be harder because of unfortunate regulation. In most of the advanced economies, firms are not going to require to uh, report to regulatory authorities the, the, the debt, actually. And that's exactly why emerging market literature is more uh, grounded uh, because they started collecting that type of credit register data well before, right, in the 1990s after the crisis. And that's exactly the problem, right? So, and that's exactly where this uh, conflicting results and the debate in the advanced economy literature is. We have some new papers looking at US. So what I cite on this paper is exclusively on US using actually micro regulatory data, matching it to census data. And those papers show actually firm credit has been very, very important in advanced economies. Again, not in a historical sense, but at least since uh, 1990s, and especially since uh, 2000s, early 2000s, it has been extremely important in driving boom bust cycles. Uh, even it's not a financial crisis like 2018, even just a regular, like recall the 2001 recession in the US, a uh, regular business cycle recession is, is, is very much linked to, to firm credit. It's just that it is really, really, uh, to get at this data in advanced countries, especially in the US. I'm going to talk more about that. Now, 
at this juncture, the work by Miller and Werner comes. I think it, it is great, right? Because Miller and Werner works is like, look, I'm going to use a lot of countries and I'm going to take this back historically. Of course, I cannot do this at the firm level because of the historic dimension and a lot of countries dimension, but I'm going to do it at the sector. And it's, this is, I think, amazing because this really bridges these two literatures and say like, look, also that non-tradable sector is really what matters. And of course, we know that most of the firms are in the non-tradable sector, the declining role in manufacturing since 1960s. So, and they are saying, you know, this both these type of credit is going to be very important for this boom bust. So it's a very important message, very reconciliatory message, bringing many different strands of, of the literature together. Okay, and then they also have a very uh, uh, intuitive backing uh, to these facts they show. Uh, they say like, look, this is going to come from three channels. First is the consumption boom story, which is obviously going to be very relevant for households. The, the credit financing demand and consumption. And they say this is also going to be relevant, relevant to a certain degree in non-tradable sectors. Again, this is the lesson we've learned very well in emerging market crisis literature since 1990s, and that's exactly how they refer to open economy models. A lot of open economy models actually uh, center around uh, this narrative. They, they don't stop there. They are going to say that, look, there are other stories, financial friction story and misallocation story. So, and then they are, and that's again, very intuitive because households and non-tradable firms in non-tradable sectors, of course, they might have tighter financial constraints and they might be less productive and having the resources allocated to them is going to be a problem. So again, here, I think it is very impressive that their work is connecting different pieces in the literature. They can speak to the papers that says there are negative effects of corporate debt overhang on aggregate outcomes. And they are basically telling us like, look, maybe this is coming more from firms in the construction sector, but not maybe in the firms, from firms from the manufacturing sector, which is of course extremely relevant for, for European firms. Okay. Now, as I said, I mean, it is very impressive and policy relevant work. I have nothing but praise for this amazing work by Miller and Werner. And, and let me also tell you that they also not only like, you know, show amazing facts and, and connect the two strands of the literature and many other pieces together. They are also providing a great service to the profession. They are constructing a brand new historical database from several countries, both advanced and emerging, not just advanced at the sector. And, and, and they, they key a driving force here is this very important question that we should all focus on. And as policymakers and academics, I think if we really want to understand the link between finance and macro, this is the question to focus on. Where does credit go? Okay. And this is exactly their driving force, guiding light, if whatever you want to call it, but they are exactly on the right path. And let me tell you, constructing this type of new data set is, is I mean, it is a huge, huge deal. Uh, since I have been involved pretty much in the last 15 years of my career, many of these type of uh, projects, uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is huge. So it is not only that they spend a lot of time on this, they are going to make this available, so it's a great service to provide. So what I'm going to do in the remaining part of my presentation, I'm going to present some results from terminal database literature and then bridge the policy implication that that literature is telling us and what uh, the work by Miller and Werner tell us. And here, let me also tell you this, the, the, this, it is the same guiding principle. The firm level literature also exactly starts from the same question that these authors study, where does credit go? And the state of the art in this literature right now, in terms of data construction and measurement is the credit register data, okay? Which is why US is such a big problem uh, and Euro is also a problem. It is getting there, ECB on a credit is a great start, but it's only uh, at the household level. Uh, we, of course, know different countries in Europe, like Spain, Portugal, Italy, they have great credit register data to going back. Unfortunately, we need this harmonized at the union level. I mean, in a way, Müller and Müller are doing that, right? They have a harmonized historical data set at the sector level uh, for many countries. So the goal here, and this is a very high bar, but if we really want to do proper policy, and if we want to avoid policy mistakes, this is where we should be going, okay? doing these credit register data sets, so which is going to tell us exactly where does the credit go for each household, for each firm, more harmonized for more countries, uh, and that is going to be like amazing. And this is like basically what emerging markets have, right? They didn't also combine it, but they have it. Uh, I don't, I can't imagine any emerging market right now not having these data sets. Why? Because they learned their lessons from many financial crises. 
And that's exactly what needs to be done with our credit. But I think they should push further on the on the corporate side, which is actually what US does. So I mean this is a little bittersweet for me because I really want Europe to do this first. And when they started on a credit, I was, oh my God, great. This is one thing that Europe is going to beat US. Unfortunately, it didn't happen because when they started on a credit, US has also started dot frank ad and started collecting credit register from firms. And now US still uh, has has the better data here than than than, than Europe. But I, I'm sure uh, you know Europe will go the same way thanks to ESRB and MC. But I will I will clarify this further. Okay, let me show you this figure. So this is the corporate debt and investment uh, to GDP for Europe and US, and this is the the loss of the duration is 2018 year. And you know looking at this figure, it is very hard to say corporate debt uh, is not an issue for aggregate outcomes. Uh, it is an issue. It's just that we have to collect it from corporate. Right, and that's really what it comes down to. So here, everything is normalized at the start of the introduction of euro. You see that periphery countries has an amazing corporate debt boom. Euro area overall also. United States is less so. Of course, now you know you extend it till 2020. United States is going to be on the uptick, especially if you use these new regulatory data and not the flow of funds data. And I'm going to tell you why that's exactly the case. And here on the right, there is the investment counterpart, and you see that again, everything is normalized. So, you know, it's kind of like there's an investment boom and a, like a, you know, downturn. But basically, the big picture uh, message here is everybody falls off the cliff and you see that periphery didn't recover by 2018. Okay, by 2018, investment, corporate investment still didn't recover from uh, uh, in periphery. There was some recovery and going down in the United States, some very sluggish recovery in the euro area. But basically, this does tell you that, like, you know, this corporate debt overhang is something that is really holding back investment in territory of European countries. And we show this clearly in my paper with Luke Levin and David. Okay. So, and here's the impulse responses for that that looks at, like, you know, high leverage firms uh, in the periphery countries on the top and the low leverage firms in the center country on the bottom. Of course, there has been a lot going on uh, during this European crisis episode in Europe, but basically, uh, you know, you know, accounting for all those things, and that's what the figure is trying to do. Like, you know, you account for all foreign bank linkages and all these other problems. You have that firms with high leverage. So the zero here is uh, 2008 uh, drop investment the most, and then they really didn't cover five years out of the crisis. Whereas low leverage firms uh, in the Central European countries, this didn't happen. And then we have aggregate exercises that linking back this. The aggregate investment that shows that this corporate debt overhang has been a big driver of uh, not recovering aggregate investment in Europe. So why? Uh, let me just say one thing here about the Schiller paper that uh, Philip referred to. Why that paper cannot pick this up? Because aggregate data and VAR is not going to be able to pick that. Okay, and let me just leave it at that, and I, I can answer questions later in Q&A. But he showed this very clearly in our new US paper using regulatory data from Federal Reserve. It's just that. You cannot pick that up with, with VAR techniques and aggregate macro level data, which again shows us the importance of going sector level in Miller and Bernal. Okay. There is an important dimension, the boom dimension of it. We know what is happening in the bus. In the bus, you know, households and non-tradable sectors really credit boom in household sector and non-tradable sector really hurts you in the bus. And you know, I'm basically saying the same thing at a firm level. Look. Firm credit uh, during the boom really hurts you in the bus. Okay, so I just put what uh, Mueller Werner said at a firm level, but it's the same lesson. Okay, so why these firms, you know, allocate accumulated credit so much during the boom, right? Because if you want to think macro prudential policy and regulate these firms and these sectors, households and non tradable sectors, you have to understand what the hell going on in the boom. Okay, this is the boom figure, and this is from my. Uh, uh, QGE paper on the location with Gopinath, Carabarbonis, and Gunaga Sanchez. Again, it focuses on Europe. And this paper argued that, look, declining interest rate, which is completely normal part of the EU integration process, incentivizes firms to finance investment with growth. Okay? So this is a channel, actually, in a sense, similar to uh, demand and consumption, but it also brings the financial friction story uh, together. It, it, it combines two channels, actually, three channels. Uh, demand, uh, financial friction, and misallocation that is highlighted in Miller and Werner. So this actually starts in the Maastricht Treaty. So this is the, the interest rate on short-term debt for corporates in Europe in blue and what we, how we match it in the model. 
I mean, it's a huge reduction, right? I mean, you can finance now short-term debt at a much lower cost, and of course, you are just going to borrow more. The problem is the heterogeneity in financial friction, right? If you have firm level heterogeneity in accessing finance in Spain, in Italy, in Germany, and this is not a country or sector level heterogeneity, this is a within sector firm level heterogeneity, then you are going to have a lot of problems in your hand. Why? When you have such a in real interest rate decline, everybody wants to borrow and everybody wants to invest. But some firms, these are going to be the larger firms, higher network firms, they can borrow and invest. They are going to face low returns to capital. Other firms, small firms and low network firms, they unfortunately cannot borrow and cannot invest. That means they are going to, are going to face high returns to capital. That type of dispersion in returns to capital is going to draw either productivity down. And as we show in our paper and also in many, many other papers, this was what Southern Europe experienced declining productivity in the first 10 years of the Europe, as opposed to Northern Europe. And that's really about these differential financial frictions. Specifically, if you want to pin, down, pin that down heterogeneity, that is a size dependent borrowing cost. So, in the extreme, you have a scenario where large firms borrow, small firms cannot, and the composition of the, that type of size distribution in your economy is going to affect it. Is there any evidence for that? Yes, this is from Southern European countries. And if you plot actually the same thing for Northern European countries, you are not going to see this. But in the Southern European countries, interestingly, uh, there is a size dependent financial friction, meaning large firms borrow more and more, okay? So this size is on the x-axis, borrowing leverage on the y-axis, and this is a convex relationship. So there are millions of firms here that says, larger you are, you are going to borrow. Okay, now let me take a stock and link it back to the miller Werner's. So miller Werner's story told us that misallocation is very important, and then they were talking about households and not construction sector. So here I'm, I'm telling you that there is misallocation even within the trade wars. I just showed you a figure for the manufacturing sector for all the Southern European countries, but it's at the firm. So this says that, I mean, you know, what Miller Werner is telling us is extremely important. You know, obviously, if it is even there within the manufacturing sector, obviously it's going to be worse for construction sector between sectors and all. And the other story, financial friction story, the same thing, right? So financial friction is going to be tighter for households and construction, but I'm showing you that you know, it is even there within manufacturing, that means you know, we, we really have something very serious on our hand because that means it's going to be uh, applicable for, for, for a while. What is the policy implication? Policy implication is obviously you are going to regulate by firm on top of the household, on top of the sector regulation that Philip told about, which is of course a great step on Basel, but if you think about it, actually, it is very hard to pull off. And I think here is one place where advanced economies really should look at emerging markets. Emerging markets did try that. They did try to regulate construction and households and not manufacturing because, of course, they have their exporters, their beloved exporters in manufacturing, and they love to keep those exporters happy, right? They did try that. It failed miserably. Why? Because the construction sector goes in a joint agreement with the, your exporting sector, goes to the bank and gets the money. Okay, so this completely leads. If you try to regulate the, the, the construction guy and not the manufacturing guy, uh, it is actually going to fail. We know that it failed in emerging markets. This is actually is, is really good. What we learn from the Werner paper and what we learn from the, the literature, look, I actually can do better. As I am regulating households, when I'm giving them debt, I look at their LTV and all that, I can do this by firm, right? Now, the big question is policy implications. So how do I do that? I mean, firms are obviously going to all firms are going to try to find loopholes around that. Now, the big advantage is most firms are going to be bank dependent in Europe, so you can regulate them through banks, and that's actually what emerging markets did very successfully. All right, what about US? Let me say one thing about US, and then I'm going to conclude. Um, so, is this something only applied to Europe or only applied to emerging markets? No. Unfortunately, US data limitations are extremely serious. What do we use in US? Flow of funds. Okay, flow of funds, you know, uh, it is going to be based on tax records on income and assets. Unfortunately, liabilities and debt is going to be a residual debt. So you are going to miss all the small firms who are going to from, borrow from banks. Corporate bond markets, of course, very deep in US, not that much in Europe. In US they are, but that's why we go and rely on the bond market data and miss all the SMEs which is actually accounting 70% of U.S. employment and 60% of U.S. output. So if we miss all that and then a crisis like COVID happens and then we say, why there is a disconnect between Wall Street and the Main Street? Why I have this huge increase in unemployment 
when the Wall Street is like breaking profit after profit. Well, if I don't measure that guy, of course, I cannot understand this department. So here's where the US new regulatory data comes. It is an amazing data set. It's basically US credit registry, known as FRY14, Federal Reserve Y14 data. It is started being collected as part of that Frank Act after the crisis, very similar experience to emerging markets, actually. That's what emerging markets did. And that's what ECB did to Dana Credit. It's just that ECB didn't extend it to firms, and they should have, actually. Now, what this is, this is a picture you cannot get from flow of funds, right? So this says, when I look at the Y14 firms, by the way, this is regulatory data. Huh? So banks reporting to Federal Reserve exactly the loan they give to the firms. Then, and then in the, in the paper, I show that these firms are going to account a very large part of U.S. employment, investment, and output. Then you, I look at their balance sheet, the large ones, very large ones, only 30% of their balance sheet is bank loan. The rest is in the bond, okay? But, so this is the ones over 75% of the asset distribution, this bottom line. But if you look at the firms in by 14, less than the 75% of, of the distribution, their entire balance sheet that is bank debt, okay? They are not in the bond market. And this figure is also going to be the case for Europe. In fact, in one of the latest things we did for ESRB, we showed that very, very little part of the corporate sector in Europe borrowed from the bond markets, largely they borrowed from banks. You see, I mean, there's nothing different between, between US once you know where to be. Okay, what does it mean? Well, in US, you are going to get the exact same convex relationship of the size-dependent borrowing constraint once you look at these private firms. So this is again, exactly the same relationship I showed you for Southern European firms, Leverage and size of employment, you see the blue convex in 2006. In 2009, at the heyday of the Lehman collapse, this goes down because not everybody becomes constrained, right? But in normal times, there is no such thing as public firms confuse that list of firm data that is widely used in the, in the US. They are not constrained. At all. This is the right and spelled figure, neither in 2006 nor in 2009, actually. Why? Because these firms can go to bonds, these firms can go to equity. These firms can do whatever they want. There's no such thing as financial constraint when we talk about Amazons and Google's of the world. And that's that thing. Okay. And then finally, linking it to boom bust cycles, what we did, and this is basically matching the census data to this. So this is the employment growth at the sector level and revenue growth at the sector level in US census. You see that you know it is going to be positively correlated with short-term leverage. During so during boom, right, the the, the firms who increase the leverage, increase the credit, is going to register higher growth at the sector level, employment and revenue. During the crisis, they are going to crush. That's the boom bust cycle, and it stays. It is persistent. Okay, that's basically what these regressions show you. Okay, what is the implication of policy here? Again, so what I did is like basically confirming what we were, were saying at the one finer granular level using firm level data. Of course, it says the importance of factor prudential regulation for household sector leverage, corporate sector leverage. Now, to do the corporate sector part right, we have to collect regulatory credit data for every agent. In European context, this means extending another credit to European firms. In US context, thank God, we now have Y14. And that's exactly how we understood during COVID, large firms draw on their credit lines, small firms couldn't, and that's when the PPP program came in. We actually designed a very good program in the US PPP based on that observation, right? And PPP is completely designed for SMEs, firms less than 500 employees, and it is a pandemic loan turned to a grant if you keep your employee. That's what we need. If we don't have that data, we cannot design a PPP program in a week in the middle of the crisis, okay? So Miller Werner were telling us that we need to watch the household leverage and non-tradable sector leverage. More granular look tells us that you have to watch the leverage non-productive large firms, for sure, that's also a time bomb there. And you have to watch what is going on with financial constraints, small firms, because of course those firms are going to borrow more and more during low interest rate environments, which is what we have right now. So in, in terms of aiming uh, for policy, promoting growth, limiting boom bust cycle, we should limit leverage on households and low productive firms and make sure high productive firms have access to finance, especially during periods of low interest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sabina. You know, you give to us a lot of information and also clearly pose a lot of questions to Karsten and, uh, and uh, Emil. So I'm suggesting that uh, I'm giving now the floor to uh, Karsten and Emil first to maybe react to all the questions that first Philip and then Sabanem, you know, pointed on, on your paper. I, I, I saw already that there is one question on the chat, but in the meanwhile that you are answering, you know, on, on their points, I'm suggesting that other 
are going you know to point question right question on uh, on the chat please so i don't know who is starting emil carster thank you laurian yeah i can start and and thank you Good. so much uh philip and shebnam for the really insightful discussions um i think i just want to pick up on three of the points um that that were raised um that that i think are useful to talk more about and i'll just take them in in order so uh philip mentioned sort of this connection when we look in the data and we look at household credit booms and non-tradable credit booms at least when we look at growth you see that these household credit booms they seem more important for subsequent growth slowdowns kind of once we uh once we control for them in the data at least in the business cycle part one point i i think that's important to keep in mind is these often really do go hand in hand and i think that you sort of have to uh, in part lump them together for two reasons. So one is kind of this demand channel that we've talked about where if, for example, you have a credit boom where households obtain more access to credit, that's gonna indirectly benefit dispro disproportionately the non-tradable sector, and they're gonna rise in their activity, and they're probably also gonna borrow more just to finance, for example, that, that working capital, right? So actually often when we think about sort of just our simple, uh, separation of good and bad booms based on sectoral data. In the end, we want to think about households and, and non-tradables really going, going sort of hand in hand. Um, and there's kind of some uh, correlation across those. But that brings me to the second point, which is actually, I really like to focus on the different case studies that you see both in the 2000s and also in the 2010s, looking at Spain, for example, versus France. Because in the paper, and this is something that we're doing more work on, actually investigating the episodes one by one and seeing, well, what was the narrative account of what happened, you know, during different credit booms and crises? Um, and then what do our data tell us about which sectors were sort of playing the prominent role? And there we see, as Carson also showed, for example, for Japan and Korea, we see some interesting commonalities, but also some differences. So sometimes it really is household credit booms, especially in advanced economies, um, that tends to be more prominent, that households are really leading along with construction and real estate. And then sometimes households are sort of taking a backseat to rising leverage more in other non-tradable sectors, uh, construction, but also uh, sectors like food accom uh, accommodation and so on. And so there are sort of different varieties of credit booms, and this is something that we're actually currently working on. They're not always the same, but they have sort of these common, uh, these common features. And What's interesting is not just their commonalities, but also some of the heter heterogeneity um, that you see. The third point I just w uh, want to make is following up on, on Shebnam's uh, uh, discussion, which I thought really made sort of an excellent point of thinking about, we've had this macro literature that's looked at aggregate credit cycles. First, we had aggregate credit from the IMF's international financial st statistics. Then we went to households versus corporates. We saw for advanced economies, it seemed like the household sector that was a better predictor. Um, and then you had this micro level uh, literature that especially focused on emerging markets, where we know in emerging markets, household credit is a much smaller segment of the credit market, uh, especially when you go back in time, although households have been borrowing more in emerging markets. And there was a little bit of a disconnect. And I think that in some ways, we're sort of moving toward each other. We're moving from the sectoral perspective where we have, you know, in, in our data, for example, typically we have one digit sector, so broad sectors like manufacturing, construction, you know, real estate, uh, mining, and so on. And we can think about the characteristics that those sectors have as being, for example, differences in financing constraints, how, how, dif how differentially sensitive they're going to be to episodes of credit supply expansion, uh, for example, or, or, or other factors. And then in the micro literature, you can really see how even within sectors, these sources of heterogeneity that we're pointing out that matter across sectors also matter within sectors. And so, you know, I think hopefully in five, 10, 15, 20 years, one day we'll get there, we'll, we'll have sort of a fully integrated perspective and it's gonna require this, this accumulation of, of data at the micro level where we can think about the heterogeneity both across and, and within sectors. Because I, def I completely agree that within sectors as well, within manufacturing, you have some firms that are actually less tradable, producing more for the local economy. You have some firms that are more leveraged. And we know that these measures that come from micro data, like the high yield share, for example, the share of risky debt that's being issued, or the share of debt that's going to highly leveraged firms, that also contains lots of important information for policymakers about what's happening in the credit cycle and the riskiness of that. And so I think that in, in some ways, 
we're, we're sort of taking one step and I'm actually very excited about sort of the future agenda and the way that Shebnan is, is, is pushing us uh, on that. Um, so let me just stop, stop here and then we can maybe take some, some other questions um, that, yeah, that, I, so, that I see are popping in. Yeah, so let's start with some of the questions and eventually, you know, even uh, uh, Karsten can, can you know, catch up later on also on some of the other points. So the first question is from Francesco Mazzaferro. He has actually two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, you know, is it the case that any real estate lending boom uh, is leading pretty much to a boom and then to a crash? Or is there any evidence that uh, you have some residential, let's say, uh, uh, real estate uh, uh, boom that was in some sense, sense a good thing? So it contributes to uh, the global wealth creation, but uh, it was not generating, you know, uh, perverse effect like uh, a crisis or, or a burst or something like this. What is the evidence? I, I think that's that's a really good question. Let me go first and then Carson can just jump in. I think when we talk about real estate booms, especially in the current discussion that we're having now in the US, in other advanced economies like Sweden, for example, where house prices are, are really high, it's important to distinguish between what exactly we mean by, by a real estate boom. Um, so there's some episodes when real estate prices rise very quickly. And that's what, what we're seeing right now is real estate prices have increased quite quickly. Um, and for example, what we've seen in the past 10 years or so is real estate prices have increased, but credit has actually not increased so much. And so, for example, in our data and also work by Greenwood, Hansen, Schleifer and Sorensen, you see that it's really the confluence of credit growth and asset price growth, re real estate price growth, that seems to signal most downside risk for the, for the economy. So when you have house price growth, for example, that doesn't come with as much credit growth, that just doesn't create as much vulnerability for the macro economy, for, for the financial system. Um, it's really the interaction of those two, two factors that helps predict the severity of, of subsequent crisis. And that's sort of the reason for that, I think, is what our, our work is suggesting and what other work has pointed to is that leverage is really the, the important factor. And so in terms of the, the stress, the, exactly, <laughs> in terms of the, the, the booms that end badly, they're really the ones where not only uh, property prices are rising, but where leverage in the, in the housing sector broadly defined is rising, both for households and corporates. Uh, and not just the size of that sector. So I, there's certainly some episodes where house prices rise and even where there's con construction, and, and obviously we know that there's big housing deficits in many countries, but the booms that are problematic from a systemic risk perspective are the ones where there's a strong increase in leverage that feedback feeds back with, with asset prices and creates those vulnerabilities for, for excessive increases in prices followed by a bus. Good, so the second question is instead of, you know, uh, what are the implications of your work when you are looking for uh, the perspective of, you know, a very large constituencies like the US or uh, Europe, uh, the Euro area in general, where there is a lot of heterogeneity across region in terms of specialized specialization in terms of tradable and non-tradables. And, uh, you know, for Europe also the fact that uh, we have also the, the impossibility of the exchange rate to adjust due to the different, let's say, characteristics of the different, uh, let's say, countries or areas and so on. So what are the implications then of your, of your study? What is the measure that you can adopt considering that, you know, there is all this heterogeneity, both in the US and also in Europe? But this measure, you know, in principle should be the same at the European level. I think that that's a really good point. And Carsten, you can jump in, but I think one of the things that we learned from the 2008 financial crisis and we had, we had known before was of course the role that different regions play in, in the economy. The, you know, in, in our integrated economies in the Euro area or, or in the US, we saw that there were large flows of, of credit that were going to specific regions in the economy. We saw this in 2008. Actually in the US, we had a similar cycle in the kind of mid late 1980s where there were big lending booms, housing booms, for example, in the Northeast that, that turned into worse uh, local recessions. So not, not only do we need, you know, macro data, sectoral data, and firm level data, as Shebnam was saying, we also need to have a perspective on how the regions are diverging. Uh, and these regional divergences, of course, as you mentioned, when you don't have the ability to adjust through 
exchange rates, uh, for example, in order to, re to readjust relative prices, that's going to create distortions that we know take a long time uh, to unwind. And so that's going to create an additional reason uh, for, for, for policy to potentially intervene, both by mitigating those really big regional booms that we have where capital flows from, you know, for example, the core to the periphery in Europe or from, you know, central US to the sand states uh, in the 2000s um, boom. So both preventing those uh, misallocations from happening. And then when the bust happens, if you don't have, uh, you know, region specific monetary policy, region specific exchange rates, then you have to think about other, other policies to help clean up after uh, that, that boom has happened. And so that's been obviously a lot of discussion post 2008 financial crisis around fiscal policy, around uh, other instruments that you can use, financial policy of cleaning up these, these debt booms and the overhang that they leave in terms of the uh, uh, reduction shortfalls in demand and, and mismatch in demand in different places that you're going to have to uh, address. Yeah, then there is this question by Antonio, and you know his point is also going on, on this direction of heterogeneity across countries in terms of the balance between tradable and non-tradable -tra sectors, you know, and I'm talking, for example, about Italy, you know, clearly tourism is a typical non-tradable sector. And it's not that Italy clearly, uh, you know, it is a fact that uh, this is an important sector. So uh, does this mean that forever this country has to be fragile due to, to the fact that there is this type of uh, composition? Or, you know, do you think that uh, uh, you should then try to create a balance between tradable and non-tradable, even if you have this structural, let's say, uh, predominance of the non-tradable, or it is better just to maintain the structure, but try, you know, to control more the non-tradable, let's say, uh, sector in terms of credit boom. Yeah, let me let me take that one. I have two quick thoughts on that. So number one is, I think you want to be careful in differentiating levels and growth rates, right? So our results are kind of about how quickly do you see a credit expansion, right? It, you, can ha you can come from kind of a high level or a low level. I mean, we, we played a little bit around with this. I think it does not actually matter that much. Um, it's really about how rapid of a credit expansion do you see and presumably bad stuff that accompanies that, like you know, excessive risk taking, et cetera. So question or, or point number two is, um, should you incentivize kind of credit to the tradable sector and so on? So I think there's a really important um, question here, when you start going really granular with these regulations, you really have to think about them. And historically, they've really been part of broader discussions about industrial policy. So what you see in many emerging economies is that, you know, these kind of really granular credit regulations, like how much credit goes to high tech manufacturing versus, you know, construction sector. I mean, obviously, there has to be some kind of accountability for why that's being done, because um, you're really shaping, you know, the structure of the economy by extending credit to one sector or another. So, you know, in that sense, I think it's it's kind of almost like a bit of a divorce point from from the financial stability considerations. But I think we need much more empirical evidence um, to 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 gauge um, what's going on with uh, with these with this kind of tension. Okay, good. So then there is uh, Javier Suarez, but also Alessio De Vincenzo that are both congratulating, and I think that oh, pretty much all the participants we are congratulating on uh, uh, for the prize. So uh, Javier is having a question, pretty much related to causality. You know, what is really the most relevant thing? So what matters for the quality of a credit boom is the composition of the aggregate demand in the background. So. Is more the demand that then is generating, you know, the fact that uh, the real estate sector construction has to grow, and then you know you are in some sense trying to uh, boil down what is coming out, but in some sense is the demand that is putting the fire uh, on the, uh, you know, behind the the pot to create all this, let's say, construction uh, boom in uh, uh, or credit boom for the construction sector in uh, uh, in that in that country. So. What is going on? What what we should care the most, you know? Because at the end, you are just trying to reduce the supply, but is largely driven with, with the demand. Yeah, I think that that's a great question, and that goes to the heart of what is it that actually drives episodes of of, of credit booms, credit cycles? Is it mostly driven by credit demand because you know consumers want to consume more, they want to consume more housing, 
or is, does it come more from credit supply in the economy, from lenders, banks being willing to make more loans, perhaps being more optimistic about borrowers' ability to repay? So here, I think two pieces of two types of evidence are, are quite useful. So one is just the case study evidence. You see that in many of these episodes of very rapid credit expansion, there's a really big role of credit supply. Um, so one international, uh, for example, factors, large capital inflows, international lenders being willing uh, to lend more to a given country, perhaps because of reforms in that country. You often also see financial liberalizations, liberalize the supply of credit that increases uh, credit uh, significantly. Sometimes it has to do with financial innovations, like in the US about securitization and being able to you know, pool uh, risk in a greater sense to channel more funds, for example, to uh, the housing credit sector. So I think credit supply just in the case study narrative perspective plays a big part of, of the fluctuations in credit. And then the second uh, piece of evidence on credit supply is other work, for example, by Krishnamurthy and Muir shows that if you look at what's happening to credit spreads during these episodes of rapid credit expansion, they tend to be quite compressed. So it suggests that it's not just that households want to go out and borrow more, and as they're asking for more credit, the you know, credit is getting more expensive. Actually, you see that lenders are, are willing to, to, to lend credit uh, at kind of more compressed, cheaper terms. And so I think that drives you know, a, a big portion of the rise in credit. Of course, then there's going to be feedbacks with demand. There's going to be feedbacks with asset prices that are going to increase demand, for example, by relaxing um, collateral constraints. But I think uh, credit supply is a sort of crucial part of, of the picture. Then once you sort of take this credit supply view as, as, as given, then what's happening, I think, is two things. One is some sectors are just more sensitive to credit supply than other sectors because they're initially more constrained. So as a stereotypical example, very, very large manufacturing firms, they're not really that constrained. They can always go out and, and, and access uh, credit in, in the public market, for example, or from banks. But when banks start wanting to lend more in the economy, it's gonna benefit, you know, it's gonna affect differentially these more constrained sectors. So these smaller non-tradable firms and households, and that's where we're seeing this, real, this reallocation. But of course, then when, when supply reverts, because there often is a mean reverting component of credit supply where financial conditions then tighten, then it's exactly those sectors that are also gonna be the cause, uh, the, the, the symptom and the cause of the subsequent slowdown and the subsequent losses for banks as Karsten showed. So I think we need more work on understanding the causality of, of the factors that drive credit booms. These are obviously very kind of complicated dynamical interactions between different shocks in, in, in the economy. Um, I think we're making, we're making some progress and I think that there's, there's, there's more to be done here. May I perhaps just add well, one minor thing, which is um, just to underscore something that uh, Shebnem uh, said in her, her excellent discussion, which is, you know, I think we've really, uh, and also uh, Philip, I should say, we really need better data on measuring the financing conditions of firms in different industries. So it's nice to have these credit data and we see, okay, there's an expansion here and expansion there. But if we want to say something about kind of the ultimate source of this credit growth, we also need to see prices at least, right? Or, or ideally some estimates of risk premium, right? Because then we would be able to say, okay, you know, it's really say in housing related sectors that you see an expansion in credit supply, lots of lending at very low risk premium, and then, you know, maybe the credit expansions and other non-tradables, perhaps that is more kind of the, the demand story, right? That now uh, those, you know, restaurants, they all want to open because, you know, people feel like they're richer because their houses are or have more value or they, uh, the construction sector is expanding. And perhaps that's really driven by credit demand. But we've tried to look at it and with current data that's available, it's simply not possible to disentangle these kinds of stories. Can I add something here? This is super, super important, what Carson said. So the, we absolutely need price data. In fact, if you look at my new paper using the Y14 data from US, US credit is just amazing. You see the price of every single credit for every single firm and the collateral posted down, right? And it doesn't tell you now a supply story, it tells actually a demand story, right? It, but it's the firm credit demand. And, you know, so you can exactly separate them. And there is a risk premium story for sure, but you can separate that from the, the, the price pressure driven by from credit demand during a low interest rate by risky firm and by not risky firm. To be able to do that, you definitely need, you know, how much they pay and, you know, what they post. Yeah. Uh, and this is definitely very important. It is in the US data. It is, as far as I know, it is not 
uh, in the European Credit Registry data. It is also in the Emerging Market Credit Registries data, by the way. So we should, if we start pushing this as on a credit in collection in ECB, we should definitely push it this way. I mean, not just collect the amount, but collect the all dimensions of the contract. I mean, that's that's why it's called credit risk. You you need to collect the data on the contract. Yeah. Yeah, in indeed, I don't understand why they are not collecting the interest rate paid. This is really something that, uh, you know, is, is not clear to me. I w and the same is in Bundesbank data. So, you know, it is all, all over uh, something for some reason that uh, it will be nice to figure out. So uh, I'm moving now to another question that I think is also very interesting. And it is, you know, uh, we are now facing this, uh, let's say, uh, this incentive, this challenge to, uh, in some sense, try to uh, address issues related to climate change, and clearly we are creating transition risk. And this transition risk means that a lot of money are going to, let's say, to, to green firms, and clearly we are going to penalize potentially brown firms. It depends on how this money will be allocated and what type of incentives, you know, public and the private sector will provide. But in any case, this is the, uh, the way that we are going to observe. So clearly, looking to the result of your paper, is this going to create uh, a boom and bust again? That's a hard question. <laughs> Carson, do you want to take that? Or I, I have some thoughts I can maybe start with. Um, so I think that there's, I think our paper doesn't speak directly to that question, which is a very important I think you know one of the big questions for finance going forward is how we're going to finance this this green transition. I do think that there are perhaps some historical lessons one can learn from credit policies that were used in different countries around the world with mixed success in the sort of immediate uh, decades after World War II. Um, so you know credit policies varied a lot across countries, but in some countries there were explicit you know credit ceilings, and that's in part how monetary policy was conducted was conducted by uh, setting specific limits on how much banks could lend to different uh, sectors. And that created both, you know, shape and allocation of credit that in, in, in some cases uh, was, you know, at least seemed to be uh, associated with successful outcomes. In some cases, Korea is perhaps the most famous example. And now we're seeing some micro data evidence from Korea that suggests that actually some of these credit and industrial policies were, were successful and, and credit was a big part of that. But we also know that it led to lots of distortions. There was lots of distortions in, in a number of ways. Um, one, sometimes you know, the, uh, the right firms weren't being lent to. Uh, in other ways, it created migration of lending from the traditional banking sector to non-banks that weren't as directly affected by these rules. Um, and so I think that you know, as we think about whether we want to do, you know, whether we want to use credit to shape the, allo you know, uh, the allocation of resources. In, in the economy, there is this useful historical um, perspective. And I think that there's both sort of benefits uh, to doing that or, or positive lessons, but also negative lessons. And it's important to think about exactly how, you know, what role credit plays and credit policy could play um, in dealing with the kind of market failure, the externalities that we think are associated with and with, with whether credit is, is, is one of the best instruments um, to do this. So I don't think we have the answers, but I think I think that there's some perspectives and I think there's there's much more work that needs to be done on this. Very good. So I think that, uh, you know, there is still time eventually for one question because we started a few minutes after, but in any case, uh, otherwise, uh, if uh, uh, there are no other comments, I have one. Uh, Loriana, I could um, say something on the climate yes. transition, uh, but just a yes, little please. bit. It it yes. just it, it add a perspective uh, to what was said, if you wish, if we still have some time. So um, it, is, it is very clear that um, the carbon transition cannot be seen. I mean, so, so the major obstacle to the carbon transition is a lack of availability of the technologies that are greener. And uh, the financing side can only do so much to uh, to solve this even if you subsidize you know all types of things um you will only achieve so much in the innovation that you would need that would allow actually the the carbon emissions to run down by the reallocation that comes from there to to greener uh, 
uh, industries. So the financing is only a, a part of the picture and um, that resembles actually what Karsten said about the question uh, with respect, what do you do with a country that has a large non-tradable sector? There is this industrial policy aspect somehow, here innovation policy, that is actually critical. And that will have a major bearing on the question on the on 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 the greening, and here's a concerning aspect, a worrying aspect, is that if you look at the current situation in the uh, Corona crisis and how the productivity race so far plays out, it seems to be that is the already large digitally very apt companies, uh, if, so according to work by the OECD, some people in the OECD that actually seem to win even more. So the gap between the, the, high, the large, highly innovative firms and the smaller local firms in the productivity race, uh, the distance to the, efficiency, to the efficient innovation in, in this becomes actually larger right now because they are less able to actually catch up on these new technologies. So there is actually needed on this uh, uh, side of the innovation policies or support of the private sector in de doing the green transformation, a major role to work on this side that I think I understood Carson to be a bit reluctant to reshape the economic structure of a country and to the, this type of planning, social planning uh, approach here that needs to happen on the innovation productivity side. And I do think this applies to this question it was just uh, just said. Without that, um, a lot of things that you do on the finding side will will actually, uh, you know, not not be effective, way not as effective as it would need be to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Yes, for pointing this. I think that on top of this, this is also related to the question I was asking, you know, we have all this digital transformation and that is also changing the, the, the characteristics of tradable versus non-tradable sectors, you know, because if you're thinking to Amazon and, uh, you know, uh, and how we are now selling goods and so on, something that was pretty much non-tradable now maybe is tradable. So we need also to consider this other aspect that uh, maybe will change the, the way we are thinking and if we are moving more, eventually versus tradable sector this is can be also a, a good a good thing i yeah. don't know if you also think about this aspect yes yeah, so I, I i i i totally agree with that so in fact i mean you know this this uh, definition kind of for how do you think about you know tradability versus maybe you know these these other sectoral characteristics that are just highly correlated with it right um, I think that's really where um, more micro data, right? So actually going to the firm level where that is really critical because you know, there are many advantages of what we're doing here in terms of just you know, getting to a reasonable number of business cycle fluctuations, getting to a reasonable number of financial crises. But of course, if you look at the sectoral data, you have to make compromises, right? In terms of how you measure things. And you know, you're exactly raising the, 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 the right question there, which is, you know, okay, so if tradability or these other characteristics change over time, right, how should we think about that? So that's why we focus on these kind of course definitions, but the hope would be that, you know, with more uh, micro data and, you know, other efforts, we, we hope, of course, that we can provide a bit of a push to this uh, uh, literature going forward. So I think that now really we are far away from the, 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 the on, in terms of time. So Thank you very much. I want really, I'm asking everybody really to close uh, to both of you for the great work. And thank you very much to, you know, Philip and Sebenen. Uh, and I want also to thank uh, Shirley and uh, Antonio and all the staff at the European Systemic Risk Board. They were really supporting us a lot on the selection of the, of the let's say, of the winner and also, you know, in setting up this uh, this day, everything went very well, and I learned a lot. And I saw that also the other, you know, uh, both Javier and, and even Stephen. I'm sure that all of us uh, learned a lot from from your paper and all the, let's say, the member of the advisory scientific committee and the rest of the participants. So, thank you very much to everybody, and uh, you know, we are ready for the next prize for the next year. Bye bye. <laughs>